Morning, everyone. I am up first today, so uh, hopefully I don't. Uh, hopefully you all had coffee and you're all awake. Um, so I'm from Thorworks, Johannesburg, and um, that's my Who Am I slide. I did a lot of effort with it. Uh, I'm a software developer, and I spend most of my time traveling between very many different client sites, consulting. And so my experience is somewhat different from product development in that I see a lot of different environments. Um, from huge banks down to you know, smaller insurance companies or perhaps even tiny websites that we have to develop for clients. And so this kind of puts me in a situation where uh, I work with a lot with different various states of old build technologies and newer build technologies. And, and uh, this specific talk is all about a situation I had that uh, cost me a week of my life. Uh, and we're actually going to be talking about what it was that we were talking about. So the title of this talk is Rapid Reproducible Builds, or uh, The Art of Treating Everything Like Production. And uh, the reason that this came up, like I said, oops, that's, that's a quote, is that a server is a server is a server. There are no test servers. There are no production servers. There are no dev servers. They're all just normal production servers. And there are no spoons, of course, too. Um, and this comes up very often because we as devs, we do our daily thing. We dev on local. We push code. Uh, if we're really, really good, then this code goes through a whole continuous delivery pipeline and ends up in production. Um, but there's one little thing that we, do, we use for all of this, right? The thing that runs all of our pipeline stuff, and that's our build servers. And uh, for some reason, we treat them differently. Or often we do. I'm not saying you guys do. Um, and so before I jump into all of that, I'd like to take five minutes to go through uh, a 10,000 feet view of Docker because uh, there weren't that many hands in the audience yesterday uh, for those who actually use it. Um, I'd like to know, does anyone run Docker in production, by the way, here? Uh, there we go. Those are all the experts. You need to talk to those guys. I'm going to give the rest of the people <laughs> a five-minute introduction, uh, just because it's going to be key to what I'm talking about later. We're going to be making use of this technology uh, to facilitate our builds. And so the first thing I'd like to talk about is the concept of a Docker image. So in Docker, um, we have some base image uh, here. This is our first layer of our image. This may have many layers below it, but we treat it as our origin, our initial image that we start with. We then add some application to it, like Nginx, and we add some config to it in a third layer. Uh, this gives us a base, sort of immutable image that we can work with. Each one of these layers is committed and cannot be changed once it has been uh, committed. And um, if I uh, move along, to the container, the container then has its own little thin layer on top of this. So it takes the base stuff, keeps all of it, and adds its own little fourth layer. And that's only in the container. Very useful uh, trait, actually, because we can then do this. We can have our base image, which has got all of our stuff in it, and we can run one or more containers off of it. Um, each container being an isolated environment, each container writing to its own read-write file system, but not affecting the original image. Um, if any of the containers want to change something that's already been written into the image, there's this technique called copy on write. So it goes and it finds the file somewhere in this layer, copies it all the way up to there, and it modifies it there. And so none of the other people will ever see that change. That's very cool. Um, so that is pretty much the basics. Um, I may have skipped over some things, uh, just one or two. Uh, there's some really cool topics in Docker, Docker networking. There's a whole DNS that's come in. Uh, there's all kinds of awesome things that it can do. But this is the stuff that I want to use for this talk um, specifically. And so this is that famous picture. I think anybody who's ever gone, what is the difference between a container and a VM, uh, has seen this picture from Docker. And so once we have that container that I was just talking about, this is where it is. It's one of these things. It shares bins and libs with other containers, either through the image or through the file system. And it runs on this host OS, and it's all facilitated by Docker, as opposed to uh, VMs, where, which are full stack. Each VM has its own whole operating system. Side effect of this is that all the Docker containers, of course, share the kernel, which is where the whole security concern comes in, um, and isolation. But let's to say, this is actually a very cool technology to use for build servers. In very many cases, uh, the enterprises I work with, build servers are hosted internally, and they're not multi-tenant. Well, you know, there's more than one dev, dev team using it, but it's owned by one person. And so we don't have that security isolation problem as you know, many cloud providers do with Docker, um, which there's a lot of cool stuff coming to solve. I think they put namespaces in 1.10, so we'll get the stuff sorted. 
OK, so that's the 10,000 feet view of Docker. What can we use these containers for? Well, we made an Nginx one, so we can probably host a web server. That's, that's one thing we could do. Um, but I want to use it for something slightly differently. Um, and before I jump into it, I want to talk about the state of the nation, which is the darkest corners of our mind, our current workstations and build agents. So what's on a workstation? What's on your development machine? What do you work with every day? What tools do you have available? What frameworks, what runtimes? Uh, now, I don't know about you. Mine looks a little bit like this. Um, that's probably because I have a lot of different clients, and they have different requirements. This is probably like a 5% snapshot of what's on my laptop. Uh, and I, I wanted to copy paste Java seven times, because there's seven different versions on my machine at the moment. <laughs> Um, and uh, I think three or four Rubies, and I've got maybe seven Node.js's, because they're all, you know, there's always a different one for a different client. We have all this stuff running on our machine, um, and it's, it's basically everything and anything you need to work on your stack, right? You may need a database like Postgres to test, a framework, uh, or a, a runner like Gradle to run your builds. You have all of this stuff. Uh, so next question is, what's on your build agent? Pretty natural, same stuff. Because if I need all this stuff to build my software, I pro well, to work on my software, I probably need all of it to build my software, too. Uh, and so this is, I like the super in brackets up there, what I call the super build agent. It's a build agent that has everything. And before anyone asks me, yes, our build agents do have Firefox and Chrome on them. And they run OS X desktop. Um, that's a free law for you. Uh, so you tend to have all the same stuff. Uh, if you're maybe very advanced, you may have maybe containerized, or maybe you have test environments that have the databases, and so you don't run them directly on the build agents. I've seen people do weird things. Um, I've seen many, many builds that start Postgres and then execute cleans, and it's wonderful when two builds run on the same server, uh, because that instantaneously kills whatever the other build was trying to do at the time. All right, so basically everything you need to build your app, as I just said. So what's the alternative? Well, there are two approaches. I'm going to jump through them in a later slide to just talk about what different ways we can structure our build agents like. Uh, but the one that I want to talk about is Docker-powered builds. So we want to take this technology of immutable images. We want to take the combination of the fact that each container is an isolated environment. And we want to apply that to build technology, to our CI servers, essentially. Um, and we're going to do that by doing pretty much what we did in the first place. We're going to start with our base image. We're going to add our runtime. We're going to add our build tool. And we're probably going to add some dependencies and configuration into it. Uh, possibly an MPMRC or something. I don't know why I didn't put that on there. So again, as I said, base image, our runtime, our build tool, and our build config and dependencies. And now we have sort of a build image. I like to call it the build image. Um, so this thing has everything in it that we need to run some arbitrary grunt commands against software. Uh, I've got another example here for the non-node inclined. This is a Java one, probably the wrong conference to talk about that. Uh, again, Ubuntu, JDK 1.8, because we're being modern. Uh, Maven 3, and uh, Maven settings. Again, base image, build runtime, build tool, and build config. This is all usually stuff you'll find on your build agent. In fact, many build agents will have both the previous image and this all bundled into one environment, which is a wonderful situation. So if you remember the picture of the container, uh, if we take this build image and we add our source code, what's the output going to be? Our build artifact. You can check my math on this, by the way. <laughs> Heard you guys complaining about that yesterday. So um, if we add the source code into our build image and we execute some command, we'll get our build artifact, right? Something we want. Maybe it's a jar, because this is a Maven image. Uh, maybe it's a zip distro of your website. Um, maybe the image itself knows how to push that to a repository. However you do it, once you add your source code to this base image, your tooling's available, and you can produce your build artifact. So we can do the same thing that we did with uh, the Nginx container, too. We can run three different app builds. And each of those builds relies on this base image that we know isn't changed, can add its own source code in, its own other requirements if it needs to, and can run its commands. All, while, all the while, depending on this sort of base image, that is not something that's going to be changed. And so instead of having a situation where we have a build agent with all three of these in it, we now have sort of three isolated environments. Really, really fun. OK, second benefit. If you take these build images and push them to a Docker registry, 
which is kind of like a, a repository for Docker images. We can then pull that same image back down onto a local machine in the exact same image onto our build agent. So if I want to reproduce the build that's running on my build server, I can just check out the image and run it. And I don't have to worry, as a new developer on a project starting up, that there's a 50-page onboarding doc that I need to do to get this app running or compiling, because that entire environment's provided for me. I can pull it down. I can build the app on day one. And even better, I can build it in exactly the same environment that the build server is going to do it. Uh, if the build server is a uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 box running blah, blah, it doesn't matter. The, the, the base environment for the build is defined by that image. Uh, and this, to me, has been one of the most powerful things, because when I get build failures, I don't SSH into the build server and check the logs and see what happened. I pull the image down to my machine, and I execute the same command as the build server. And I get the same error most of the time. Uh, only when someone messes with Docker does it change. Um, but yeah, a very powerful tool then, um, and a very powerful ability. So, talked about build agents. If we have that build agent, as I said, we can have many different builds, all running in parallel, all producing artifacts, all being completely isolated. And this outer build agent, this server somewhere or instance somewhere, it doesn't even need Ruby installed or Node.js installed or Maven or JDK or anything on it. It just needs to run Docker. And it will pull these images down that we've pre-prepared for it or that it's built itself because it can bootstrap itself. And it can run that and produce our artifact and it never needs to know about dependencies at all. Pretty cool. So now we've got sort of our build agent. We understand imaging. Uh, I want to take a minute to run through what it looks like in a pipeline in a container. Uh, so in our build pipeline, well, first off, I want to talk about enterprises that build all the things. <laughs> As I mentioned at the beginning, that super build agent, that, that, that thing that has all that stuff in, I literally work with one every day. Um, and it's because that build agent is used by maybe, I think it's 10 or 12 different teams. Uh, and any one of those team members can just kind of connect to it and do whatever they want. They all have root access to it. And maybe you guys are going to start by telling me that's a bad idea. Well, yeah, I can't really do much about that. Um, I'm not the one that con uh, controls the access to the server. But we did have a situation where someone SSH to it, in the, or actually remote desktop to it in the middle of the day, and then decided to click install El Capitan. Because um, I said it's an OSX server, right? And uh, that was about a week to recover the build from that, because it turns out El Capitan broke everything. Um, and so configuration management would probably have helped. It would have been a good idea. But I was trying to get around that. Uh, we had another situation where someone SSH'd into the box and said, oh, I'm going to upgrade Node on this machine because we need it for our new build. And then like seven other builds broke because they didn't need it and they weren't working. Uh, and this is where this all comes from, that sort of week of pain. So as I was saying, we have this super build agent, the one that people SSH into and install things randomly on. It's quite complex because it has lots of stuff in it. Uh, it can be containerized. You can containerize this, this node itself if you want to, but there's a lot of work to do that. You would need to kind of um, write all your configuration management, build this image, check it, manage it, uh, and check it against your builds as well. Uh, it holds all the build tools and configuration for any type of build it can service, so we can have all these different kinds of builds. It results in high build contention. As I was saying earlier, if you have 10 teams or 20 teams or 100 teams all using the same build agents because they can provide any services, you get kind of a build backlog that builds up. It's kind of really scary. Um, it's difficult to scale because I can't put, well, I can put 10 of these down if I want to, but I need to configure and manage every single one of them. And if there's a change, I have configuration management, it's going to be a bit easier, but they're big, they're lumpy, they're quite difficult to manage. Um, and uh, I like the part about pushes artifacts to repositories. That's just a Java thing. Ignore it. Uh, right. So I mentioned earlier that there's a different kind of one. This is the micro build agent. And this is a pattern I see more often in enterprises these days, where each team has its own build agents. Um, it's much simpler. can be easily containerized. It holds the build tools and configuration for only the builds it can service. So for example, it can own, this one can only do Maven 3 and JDK builds. Uh, much easier to scale these, because I can say, well, we've got a lot of Java builds, so maybe I can run 10 of these all to service our, our 100 teams. Uh, we can much more easily manage this configuration as code. 
Uh, and so this is a better approach than, than this one. I mean, it's, you can just tell by the amount of stuff in it that it's going to be a lot easier to work with. Uh, at least this one has at least three different Java home variables to set. Anyone who's dealt with that knows that's fun. Um, but it still can be improved, I think. And that brings me to my last one, which is if we combine build containers with build agents, we get container build agents, which are, mm, which are just basically micro agents that run nothing but Docker. So if my build agent doesn't have to care about its tools or environment or anything else, all my agent needs to be able to do is say, I'm going to check out an environment from a repository somewhere, and I'm going to execute a build against it. Uh, it doesn't have any build dependencies in it. It doesn't have the JDK. It doesn't have Ruby. It doesn't need any of that. It just needs to be able to run whatever build agent you have, whether this is a Jenkins instance or whether it's a bamboo agent. For those of you who have to deal with bamboo, um, it's not that bad, actually. Uh, it pulls those containers down and it builds. It's very simple to scale because it can do any kind of build that we need it to. And so that means if we have a high build requirement, we can just horizontally scale our agents as far as we need. In fact, I've heard of people elastically scaling builds like this before, which is a really cool idea. We have many builds in the pipeline. They need to get through to production, put more agent capacity down. They can handle anything. I don't need to look for specific configure, uh, specifically configured ones. Um, and so this is what, what we are doing at the moment uh, at the client site that I'm on, is that we have a couple of these, I think five of them, and they serve as a couple of different builds. Uh, some of them are Java, some of them are Node. You can probably tell because that was what was in the presentation. Um, and they elastically scale. So if we have a couple of builds sitting around for, uh, for our JavaScript stuff, then we just scale up to three nodes. We have them build in parallel if we need to um, because we have more than one site. And same on the Java side. If we need to build some more stuff, uh, we just bring up more of them when we need to. Um, and that's been a boon to our sort of production, getting things through. Uh, the other side effect of this was that because this build image is running inside of Docker, uh, we had the situation where we were testing stuff sort of on a single Chrome instance on a desktop machine somewhere uh, as part of the build pipeline. Uh, the desktop machine was in the server room, so it was fine. Um, Totally legit. Uh, and the problem was that we got kind of bottlenecked here. We would have one Chrome instance running 380 acceptance tests against the website, and that's just slow. Um, and so once we moved into Docker, it became really easy for me to go pull some Selenium images from the internet and say, well, let's spin up a Selenium grid on the side. We can spin up four or five inst uh, isolated instances of Firefox or Chrome, and we can run those tests headless in the background on a server which was a lot better than that desktop machine in the server room. Um, also, it worked whenever anyone plugged it up because it wasn't a rack. So that was a very nice add, is that we could bring the build time down uh, simply by adding containers to handle our testing. Um, we could also create entire test environments from scratch, because once again, we're inside of Docker, and we just need to add containers on the fly. We don't need to provision full VMs. And so when we needed to, to switch from stub testing to testing against a uh, the Java API, we would just spin up a container with JBoss in it and drop the app on it. Um, or we would spin up a database on the fly. And, um, and one of the projects I was on previously, we were using a Django stack. And uh, there we actually just, all the test environments were completely created on the fly. They, they didn't exist until the time that the build server needed them. And it was all enabled by having this sort of containerized pipeline where we could load our code, build stuff, and then execute stuff against our container. Uh, it was just really, really magical uh, for a person who has a machine that has all that stuff on it. Cool. So what does it actually look like when I take these Dockerized agents and I take my build images and I put them on a CI server? Uh, so those of you who were complaining about Jenkins yesterday, this is Go. It's a ThoughtWorks tool, but it's open source, and I'm not punting it. I'm just using it. Uh, this is a plain Java app. And you can see it's built off some Git repo. Uh, and it's red, uh, and it's building directly on the agent. Uh, I can promise you that. I know there's nothing here that proves that, but I set it up, so I know. And it's failed due to environmental issues. In fact, in this case, it failed because Maven wasn't on the build agent. Uh, it turns out that the, the, the agent I downloaded had the JDK, but it didn't have Maven. Um, and so here is a different application building off a build container. We have some arbitrary... Uh, Git repository there, oh, there's a little pointer thingy. We have some arbitrary Git repository there. In there, we have whatever defines our build environment. 
And we can assemble a container from that. And this application then depends on that container as well as its own source code. And this one's green. And I say it's green because you know, it had Maven this time. Uh, but you don't have to believe me. And of course, if we take a zoom out view and we look at our, uh, our, our build container and all of its dependencies, we can see here are two builds. Both of them rely on that build container. Uh, if we were to expand this into a much bigger environment, we may have several build containers on the left. We may have a lot of different apps depending on them. We may have different versions of build containers as well. One of the very interesting side effects of this, um, of this technique is that you can actually version your build container alongside your source code. So um, everybody here has source and source control, hopefully. Um, if you don't, talk to someone, anyone here, they'll help you. Um, it's this new thing, source control. It's really cool. Um, so if you've got your source, source control, you probably tag it on release, or maybe you branch, whichever strategy works for you. Um, and hopefully, at some point, one of you may have encountered this, where someone says, well, we need to check out the previous version and build it um, to check for an issue against current production or something like that. I was in that situation. I checked out the previous code. I built it. It didn't work. Um, it was in a uh, release branch, so I expected it to compile at least. Um, I then proceeded to say, fine, let's just go to the build server. We'll change the build server's target and build from a different tag. We did that. The build server failed to build it. And it turned out that someone had migrated from Maven 2 to Maven 3 during the last release. And so we were no longer able to produce any of the artifacts we'd produced previously. We still had the old jar files in a Maven repo somewhere. We still had the old artifacts, but we couldn't reproduce them. Uh, if we needed to make code changes and push that to production, we were, we were completely you know, in an undercoverable situation. Uh, another a benefit here is that that build environment's actually versioned alongside your app. So if you keep those build images, you can always reproduce the exact same artifact in the exact same build environment at any point in time. Um, so if it's three years down the line and someone wants to rebuild an old app that's been running for three years and hasn't been touched, and you're not sure whether your build agent has the right dependencies, security patches, or anything else, you can just pull your container and build it. And it should work. I'm not promising anything. Um, but the ideal is that the environment's been fixed in time, and so it won't change. And that's been kind of a useful idea. I haven't used that in, in any situation. I mean, I only worked on this about a month ago, so I haven't had time to. But I think that in the future, it could be something that adds a lot of value, uh, being able to go back to any snapshot in time. Cool. Oh, I had some little slides there. There you go. Build a container. Applications building in containers, <laughs> in case you were wondering. Uh, by the way, uh, to those who said something about Jenkins' wonderful pipelines plugin, uh, this is Go's pipeline plugin. Oh, it's not a plugin, it's just the base thing. It looks pretty. Um, I tried to use the Jenkins plugin once, and it's no, please. Um, I'm not going to put punch, punt product here, but it's free, so go play with it. <laughs> and now I'm done punting product. <laughs> okay. Right, so there's a couple of things I still want to uh, want to share with you guys, and one of them, this is fairly obvious, um, or it seemed fairly obvious to me when I started doing it. It was something that I've built up in the past. Uh, I call this the Go script. Uh, some of you may have heard of it under different names, maybe Build script. Um, we've done a lot of work in the years to ensure that we don't have to take, to do 20 things to get our source code to compile and test and run in production. But we're still pretty bad at one thing, and that's that we still configure the build on the build server, or the majority of it anyways. So what happens when your build server gets killed? Uh, you know, aliens come and abduct it. A cow walks in and eats it. It, it happens. Um, what happens when that build server goes down? Well, the first thing is hopefully you've backed up your configuration. I, I hope. Um, I was once in a situation where we didn't. Um, maybe you have configuration as code for your build server. That's excellent, right? All of our builds um, are configured, and all of that is stored somewhere in a repository. That's fantastic. It means we can spin everything back up. Maybe one of the things I can tell you is keeping as little configuration as possible on the server makes all of those much easier. So that seems pretty obvious. And then the next one is, what if we kept that configuration next to the app that it builds? Uh, so what if we could somehow uh, Instead of configuring all the stuff on the build server, the seven steps, what if we could just have something inside of the app that knows all this stuff? And so that's the one I think is the most important. And it's the Go script. It's a script for your build actions. Now, 
a lot of you will probably look at me like I'm crazy and go, what, what are you kidding? We've got Grunt that runs tasks. We've got like Rake and it does build stuff. I agree, we have all these things. The problem is that Rake has 17 tasks on it and Grunt has like 20. And Gradle tasks prints out a screen full of information. And we run all those tasks, right? We run clean and then we run uh, bold and then we pass in three arguments to it so it builds a different version and then we pass in this thing. We, we do all this stuff and we tend to do it on our build servers. So what this script tries to do is know all the commands to build your app. Not necessarily just what is in my rake file or what is in my Maven configuration lifecycle stuff, but what commands do I need to execute in what sequence? Fairly simple, right? Sounds pretty obvious. Uh, I wrote, write mine in bash most of the time. It's very straightforward. Uh, I say keep it simple. So you know you could use something more sophisticated if you wanted to. But the most important thing to me is this. Everything that works on your build agent should work unmodified on your local environment. So if I execute a command against the script that I'm now uh, creating, I should be able to do that on my local machine. And I should be able to do it without doing anything. So if there are environment variable dependencies, it should just set sane defaults. Um, assume things, check that, uh, that, that all the requirements are there. And this is really cool because if we go back to being able to check out that image on our local machine, and run the build in the same environment, if we combine it with a script that does exactly the same command that the build server does, we now have a one-to-one -one replication. We can now just go run this command, it'll go and pull out the container, execute whatever needs to be done, and it works exactly the same. Once again, reproducibility. I like it. The build server should just call the script, exactly like I would on my local machine. Once upon a time, we did this. Once upon a time, we ran one command on the build server. Now we don't. And we should use environment variables for environment changes. So instead of having four config files, um, you know, one for test, one for dev, one for prod, uh, one for staging, let's just use environment variables for what they're good at, which is environment config. Uh, and one thing that I think I missed here was that, I mentioned it earlier, was that if these environment variables exist, set same defaults. Um, if you run the script and there are no environment variables, maybe assume we're on the local environment and we want to build there. I got a picture of one here. I realize this probably came out really badly. But this is just a sample of one of the scripts that I use on client side. Uh, this specific one is responsible for building uh, the Docker build container. And it does all kinds of pretty things. It does some, some creating Docker networks up there. It sets some build arguments, because I need to be able to connect to the internet through a proxy. Uh, and it assumes that if these things are not set, it doesn't need to worry about them, because you're on a local machine, and you probably have a direct connection. Or if you had proxy set on your local machine, it would take them and add them. Uh, there's a bit, it assumes that if you didn't pass in uh, a, a version, uh, if it assumes if you did pass in a version, that you want to version the image that comes out, otherwise it'll use the latest tag by default. So it tries to deal with everything for you, so at the end of the day, all you have to do is build, and this thing will go and build itself. Um, and that's why I was saying, we. We oftentimes on build servers go and smack in this entire command in all of its glory. Uh, or even worse, we go and install a build plugin. Um, I was using Bamboo's Docker plugin the other day. And so that allows you to like drop down configure stuff. It's really cool. Except that you have no idea what it's actually running at the end of the day. And uh, it didn't actually support passing build args, which was a problem. So this seems fairly obvious, and I guess now that I'm going through it, um, and I'm probably in front of the wrong crowd to tell this to, because all of you are like, well, we do this, so that's pointless. But I think it's a really cool idea. I think that it's made my builds much simpler, and if I combine this with my fixed environments, I now have the ability to just run one command on my machine. It'll pull whatever build environment, whatever dependencies it needs. It does everything it needs. It produces an environment that runs the build. Um, and that works for me. It's really simple. Um, we had a new guy on board, start of last week. Uh, he brought his Windows laptop in, we formatted it. Uh, we put <laughs> Linux on it. Um, we're not doing .NET, so we don't need Windows. Um, so we, we, put a, we put Ubuntu on it, because he wanted Ubuntu. Uh, and we installed Docker, and then we said, let's test this out. So you install Docker, clone this repo, and run this command. And he did, and he got everything done. It ran all the tests, ran all the acceptance tests against the stubs, and it produced the output. And this was a really cool test of, of minimizing your onboarding dock to two lines. Install Docker, run. Uh, I liked that. It was like a moment of glory. <laughs> also a moment of trepidation. Didn't know if it was actually going to work. Um, 
yeah, but that's pretty much it. I want to talk about putting it all together. Uh, I have a quick sort of showing that I want to do. I need to be done in 10 minutes, I think. Um, right, right about there. So I want to take you guys through um, just kind of what does this look like IRL. So I have some demo stuff set up. Cross your fingers. We'll see if this works. Uh, keynote. Right. Um, OK. So this is my CI server. We can see that there's at least one failed build on it. So I've done a good job of this demo. Um, we have one of our build containers up here. This is a Maven build container. If we go peek at uh, its configuration, we'll see it has a task assemble environment. And this actually just does, it executes a Go script, right? So like I told everybody, execute Go scripts where you can. I probably need to make this a bit bigger. There you go. So we're just running one thing. We're running Go. Uh, I'll take a moment to go poke into that. Ooh, wow, this is all wrong. My apologies. Um, so if we take a moment to go poke around, we'll find that that's not my clients. <laughs> you didn't see anything. That's not on the video. Uh, it doesn't exist. So we can uh, quickly see. I completely lost my spot here. Oh, yes. We can quickly see that if we go to this container, there's a Docker file, there's a Go script, and there's a settings.xml, which is Maven's kind of configuration for the build. I'm going to share with you some state secrets here. So, uh, so hang on. This is going to be pretty cool. Not just that Adam is awesome. Uh, maybe I should just do this in the terminal. So that's my deployment password. It's best practice. Um, industry default. And fancy hint, by the way, if you go to most client sites, try that as the password. It kind of works half the time. <laughs> so that's our, our settings for our Maven repo that we're actually putting into the environment. And what this defines is where can I find the Nexus server? Uh, and what is my username and password for my deployment? Now, I do not recommend baking the username and password straight into the image, right? So don't tell, don't tell people I told you that. I just did it for demo purposes. What I would recommend is possibly passing it as an environment variable or better yet, reading it off a secret store. Um, but the idea is that this is the configuration. And I've seen much more complex ones where you have... Uh, different repositories on client side for different artifacts. So maybe there's a spot that all the shared libraries go to, and there's one where all the apps go. And you configure all of this, and you put it in your image. So it's there. It's snapshotted at that point of time. And hopefully, it's valid. Uh, the next thing that we have here is a Docker file. Uh, and that's the world's simplest Docker file. I really like that one. So I cheated. I started with a Maven base image instead of starting from Ubuntu, because I'm lazy. <laughs> And so this thing actually says, let's start with Maven and the JDK 8, and we're going to add the settings in, and we're going to make some directory called build, and we're going to start in that directory. And then if you execute anything against this container, it's going to try and Maven run it. So that's our build container. It's really as simple as that. The last thing we have is, I'm going to clear the screen so we can just check again, is we have our Go script. And our Go script knows how to build our image. It says build dash dash force rm. Uh, and tag it as that name. Oh, crap, that didn't work out well. And that's why my build server just says, well, go. It's not going to go and doc, uh, know exactly how to run Docker. It just knows that there's a script that can do it. And so the net result of this is that I have this build image. And if I go into the Docker file, we can go and change something. Maybe we change the settings. That's a good idea. So let's go change our super secret password, um, because that's a good idea. Ooh, having a good day with VI today. So super secret password changed. Uh, we're going to add that. We're going to do two, two statuses, and then we're going to say password changed. OK, mm, that's fine. I'll live with the typo. And we're going to push that to our local GitLab instance. And uh, here in GitLab, we can go and see. This is our Maven container project. And uh, there's our commit password changed. We can see that we changed our password. This is actually going to cause the build to fail, by the way, which is awesome. And uh, at some point within the next century, my CI server will pick up this change. And it's actually going to rebuild my build container. And then it's going to rebuild everything down from there as well. Because it's going to say, your build environment changed. So let me rebuild everything for you. Uh, kind of a useful thing. Uh, maybe. Or not. <sighs> OK. Anyway, so that uh, was the environment change. So that's as simple as a, as a build container needs to be, right? It, that's the, the basic idea, is we have some set of 
of dependencies for our build, and we've added them in. In a more complex example recently, I actually made a base node container, and we actually pulled in the package JSON file for our node application, which defines, in this case, it defined all the build time dependencies for the application. It was not a Node.js application. We were just using Node as our, as our you know, through for grunt for running all of our tooling stuff. And one of the things that we could do with it is we could pull in this package JSON file, and we can uh, do an NPM install, which installs about 300 megs of lots of JavaScript on your machine. And what our build was doing previously is that every time an agent started a build, it does an NPM install. And it does this to ensure that I am build agent 5. I may or may not have the dependencies. Uh, what we did with the Docker image is that we actually did the NPM install into a pre-built dependencies container that was based, or image, that was based off of our node image. Uh, and that meant that every build could execute against a set of frozen dependencies, which was kind of nice. It also meant that our build no longer needed to run this massive command, and we only ran npm install whenever something in package.json changed. So only when our dependencies changed did we actually bother to download everything again. Uh, it was pretty useful. I know there's a lot of other techniques, uh, like hosting your own node repos, that aid in this, but in our case, we were not able to do that because regulations and WebSense proxy. Um, and what's the name? Cool. So hopefully that's picked up by now. Yep, there we go, label five. So we've built a new container. Uh, so we haven't run this for our upstreams. So it's telling us that there, none of the upstream builds have run off this new container. I actually probably forgot to configure the trigger for that. But if we rerun this build now, uh, this should uh, fail on the second step. So again, our first step is going to be adding our code to that container like I was showing in the presentation. And our next step is going to be actually executing against that build container. Um, and on our first step, we can see that it's just hanging around, waiting for things to happen. Uh, what we want to see here is we want to see, oh, there we go. We want to see it added our code. So we can see that it's taken that base image and it's added our source code. Um, by the way, you don't need to create new images. This is just something that I did for the demo purpose because it makes it easy to, to handle. You can also volume mount things in with Docker. Talk to one of those Docker people. They'll tell you about it. Um, so once we've added that code in, we're now going to go and execute our Maven command against it. I fully suspect that we'll see a build failure at the end because we've changed the password, and I haven't actually changed the password on the Nexus server. But this proves that if an environment changes, if something in our environment changes like our build config, um, we should most certainly see that fail. And we'll see it fail, and we can track it back to a change in the container and in the environment. Uh, go, go, go. Yes, being slow today. It's built on Java. It's not really fast. There we go. Cool. All right, so here's going to be uh, the usual Maven console spam. Uh, oh, my own. Scroll to end of logs. Useful button, that. Uh, mm. OK, there we go. And we can see here, failed to execute goal, could not transfer artifact. Well, I can see, because I'm used to reading Java output, uh, response unauthorized. And so we now have a failed build. It's actually rerunning the build for the other one, too, which also failed. And uh, one of the nice things is that I can look at this label, and I can see it comes from container version 5. And I can look at this thing to say, OK, cool, what was build number 5? It was these changes. All right. Let me go take a look at what happened in that thing. And of course, because you guys are sitting here, you know the secret. Uh, we changed the password. And so all of that I can track back to how my environment changed instantaneously. I can see how it failed. I can see how it passes. I can go fix it uh, by doing that thing that uh, our first speaker yesterday does, which is revert people's commits. Um, <laughs> I like how I can revert my own commit. I'll feel good about it. There we go. Let's just uh, revert. Uh, uh, you think I know how to do this, right? <laughs> Could not revert. Mm. OK, I'm going to give up because I'm bad at reverting things. Um, it was deleted? OK, no, I give up. It's fine. So anyways, I'm not going to show off how bad I am at Git right now. Uh, I don't need to. You've already seen it. But, I <laughs> but you can see that I don't revert people's commits very often. But you can see that the environment's changed, right? Uh, we can see that, that all the way back. And uh, if my build server was smarter, which I really wish it was, but it's not that smart, uh, I would be able to tell this build to rerun against the previous container. Um, unfortunately, the tooling 
it's still very much build server tooling, and so we don't have the, quite the advanced capabilities yet to just say, we'll go back to the previous container. Um, I was looking at Marathon and Mesos yesterday, very excellent talk, and I thought to myself, well, that's a great thing. We just need to add Git polling, and then we have a new type of build server. That'd be awesome. Um, but yeah, there we go. That's our environment. We can see tracking environment changes. We can see our build. Uh, succeeding and failing based on the environment, and we can tell that someone's gone into the server and changed something, unlike that guy who installed El Capitan on a freaking Thursday morning. Cool. That kind of sums up the demo, so we're going to hop back to the slides. Uh, no, we're not. Okay. Goody. Keynote. Thank you. Right. Cool. It worked. I think I just got, like, one a bet or something. All right. That's actually it, guys. I'm... Uh, I'm really happy that the demo worked. I'm really happy that all this stuff ran. The last time I demoed it to a bunch of people in Joburg, um, my VM died, and it was a really good day. <laughs> Fortunately, everything was reproducible 10 minutes after the demo time was over. Um, <laughs> it was a good day. So that's all I have for you. Uh, I hope this has been interesting. I haven't I ironed out all the issues yet, so there's a lot of small things that have come up for me. Uh, caveats like when you build Docker images, um, you need to ensure that each layer that you commit is, you know, cleans up after itself because once it's there, it can't be changed. Uh, there are all kinds of smallish things that you'll run into. Um, there's things that I haven't run into yet, but what I can tell you is the base idea behind it has worked for us. It's actually made our builds faster and more reliable uh, and more resilient. And that's been a huge boon to our team. Uh, at the end of the day, there are some important things in life. Build downtime causes downtime, right? If my build is failing because somebody upgraded Node, I've got a whole team of people that can't get software into production. And not because any of them aren't running their tests, not because any of them aren't doing the best they can, but because someone on another team decided not to do what they were supposed to do. And, and this allows us to isolate things, uh, track those failures, and figure out exactly what's going on in our environment, know exactly what's going on in our environment at all times. To tie it all back to that line, treating everything like production, if we're willing to go and dockerize things in production to say, we want to fix our environments, we want to ship containers anywhere, why don't we just do that with builds too? Why don't we just move our build to anywhere, uh, move our environment with our build, and also make sure that it's treated like production? Cool, that's all I got for you. Questions? I obviously did a really good job describing this. <laughs> Somebody ask about disk space. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hi, thank you. This is a great overview. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how the customers that you're working with setting up, you know, CI, CD, or at least CI pipelines, uh, are they more interested in using it because they would be using Docker? Or is it like you kind of have to lead them to the Docker? I'm just kind of curious what the general attitude is around it. OK, that's a good question. Um, very often, they do know about Docker. So uh, a lot of the people in infrastructure know about it, have read up about it. Uh, and so if you bring them something and say, this is using Docker, they'll feel a little bit more comfortable. I think if I went to them with something like Rocket, they may tell me, hmm. Um, but yeah, that, I think Docker helps. I think they, they do know about it. A lot of people out there do know about it. And a lot of them are stopped by, you know, the powers that be above them that say, no, we've been doing this for years like this. We shouldn't change. Uh, I'm excited that they do this. Uh, I, this actually started off, I started off with it on my local machine, and I went to talk to one of the infrastructure guys. And uh, he came to me and said, well, he was actually just kind of, he had some nodes that he got, and he was experimenting with it. And so the fact that there was someone doing stuff like this really just helped him jumpstart everything. Cool. Uh, yeah, for someone coming from uh, Jenkins, if they wanted to migrate to something like Go, mm -hmm. um, how easy is it to automate? I mean, we've, we've spent a lot of time uh, automating Jenkins, getting into a state where it's easily reproducible. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you be able to do something the same thing with Go using something like Puppet, for example? Yeah, so I'll, I'll show you the, the, the smoking gun for this entire presentation. Uh, this is all running in Docker, of course. Oops. This is all running in Docker, of course. Uh, there you can see. So uh, you can run Go as a Docker container if you want. Um, it's actually fairly trivial to set up. Uh, it's got one core config.xml that manages all of the build configuration. Uh, so that can be versioned pretty easily. 
Um, and it can be provisioned onto a server fairly simply too. So I don't know how you've done Jenkins with Puppet. I assume uh, it's just downloading, starting up, loading configuration into it. The same standard stuff is possible with GoCD server, yes. Uh, I'm not first to ask, though, probably the GoCD guys are. <laughs> I just like using it. Cool. Hi there. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on debugging builds when they go wrong. Oh, uh, that's a fun one. Yeah, yeah, do you find that more difficult with Docker? Because I tried something similar and really ran into a world of hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. So one of the ways, uh, uh, if I want to debug a build that's gone wrong, um, I can pull the container to my local machine, and I can actually execute that, that same build, um, hopefully through the Go script, since I've talked about it just now. Um, I can actually execute that, that same build on my local machine through this Go script. And I can actually attach a terminal to it and see the output that it's providing. I could also execute the container in such a way that it doesn't run the, the build command, but rather drops me into a bash shell inside of that container. And so then I can start running things in the environment to see if there's anything wrong. So is it more difficult than debugging it on a native environment? Yes, but only because you have to bash into the container. And that's one command, so we're fine <laughs> so far. That guy's laughing. He's bashed into a container before. <laughs> I bashed my head on one once. No other questions? Oh, there we go. Uh, how do you guys solve uh, waiting for services to come up inside Docker? How do I solve waiting for services to come up inside of Docker? Yeah, if you've got to push stuff around and you're mm -hmm. waiting for a database connection to come up or and it doesn't come up. Uh, sorry, what to come up? Like, like a DB connection. So if you've got to oh. push something somewhere, you know, internally the, the dependency checking mm -hmm. is not that hard. Fair enough. Um, so when we, when we provision test environments on the fly, this was actually a problem because uh, we were starting Postgres alongside our app, and we needed to run tests. And so Postgres didn't come up within the first five or 10 seconds. It takes a good chunk of while to come up. It actually takes about 15 or so. So the first primitive solution that we did was obviously just build a wait into our script that started up the containers, which wasn't really good. Uh, tracking whether a container running is, is running is not the same as tracking whether the process inside of it is working. And so this is something that is a known sort of issue at the moment. Uh, and I don't have a clear solution for you other than to take your use case, figure out how to, to, to figure out that it's ready to run, and add a wait condition in to see whether it's ready. Um, with the Selenium servers and the grid, uh, I have the benefit of being able to start them first and then run the build. And implicitly, the build takes time. And so the Selenium servers finish booting by the time uh, the, the build's re ready to use them. Um, but that's kind of an incidental thing. And I do need to fix it at some point. Uh, what I would say is, if you have something like a database server, you could maybe poll it to see whether it's up and then start the next job if you need to. But there's no built-in mechanism in Docker or Compose or any of its other tools to handle that. That's an application level thing, I think. 